Hey there, everyone. Dave Keller here, Chief Market Strategist at StockCharts.com, and welcome to this special edition of The Final Bar. It's a travel day for me. I'm heading down to New Orleans for a conference called FinCon to talk with some financial YouTubers and podcasters and uh, others to uh, sort of refresh and refocus and learn as much as I can to hopefully make The Final Bar even awesomer as we uh, continue through 2023. Today's special episode is called, How Would You Rank the Magnificent Seven Stocks? We talk a lot about mega cap leadership and how significant it is uh, in terms of their weight in the index, in terms of their dominance of returns in 2023, and in terms of the challenges if and when some of those magnificent seven, some of those mega cap tech communications and consumer discretionary names start to struggle which we're starting to see here in August, September into October, stocks like uh, Netflix and others uh, really breaking down and rotating uh, more into a confirmed bearish phase. What we're going to do today is sort of talk about the dominance in these mega cap stocks, look at some charts that help us understand the conditions around those names, and then I'll share with you my ranking of those uh, really magnificent eight, I guess is what we'll call it. I call it Magnificent Seven and Friends. Uh, I couldn't handle just seven, so I have eight of them. I would love for you to listen to uh, how I rank them and then put a comment below. Let me know how you would rank these eight stocks from best to worst and why. So to start things off here, let's talk about the overall market conditions. We're here in mid-October here. And, uh, you know, essentially I've talked about the market being in sort of a limbo phase, right, between trend line resistance and the 50 day to the upper end between the 200 day moving average and Fibonacci support on the lower end. So the upper end currently kind of in that 4,400 to 4,450 range, the lower area of support around, we'll call it 4,180 to 4,230, we'll call it, right? Sort of this whole general area around 4,200. I have this purple shaded area to signify the 200 day moving average down to the 38.2% retracement level. One of the things we've talked about, right, I think in general, you have to think about the trend on different time frames. I would argue that the short term trend of lower highs and lower lows still down until we can kind of make a new swing high and get above 4,500, 4,550. So overall trend appearing to be lower for now. But the longer term trend, you're really holding the 200 day moving average, I think is pretty key. And as long as we hold the 200 day, things just aren't getting that bad. And that's an area I call sort of the line in the sand, right? That level, as long as we hold above it, conditions just aren't getting uh, aren't getting too bad. So for now, as long as the S&P holds that 4,200, we'll call it down to 4,180, holds that range around the 200 day moving average, just conditions are not that horrible. So we have a short term downtrend, which has now reached the long-term support range. So the fact that we're getting a tradable bounce off of that level of major support, not really a surprise. I think that makes a ton of sense. The real question is what happens after that bounce. I think if you're bearish here, you'd expect a bounce off of key support and then a rotation lower and a break of that support level. If you're bullish here, you'd expect a higher low. You'd expect the 200 day to hold on the next pullback and then we continue higher. So the next low I think is pivotal. Does that next low happen above or below sort of that 4180 to 4230 range? I think that's the really most important question to answer into uh, October, into November, really. I think that'll tell us a lot about the likelihood of a meaningful rally going into year end, which the seasonal tendencies would tell you that's pretty common, right? In uh, November, December, I have a pretty, pretty strong uh, market condition. Go back to 2018, though, and you'll see an example of a year where that did not play out. So not always. Now, why do we talk so much about the FANG uh, index, the FANG stocks, or the Magnificent Seven, or the Menomina stocks, or whatever you'd uh, choose to call them on any given day? Simply because they are such a huge weight. Now, how big of a weight are they? Here are the top, uh, you know, uh, let's say the Magnificent Seven stocks. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, NVIDIA, two shares of Alphabet, Meta, and Tesla. Now, if you look, they make up about 25%, 27%, I want to say, of the S&P 500, given where we're at right now, given the, given the current market conditions, uh, 27%. So those eight stocks basically make up over a quarter of the S&P, which means if Apple is moving significantly to the upside or downside, and we've seen that sometimes in recent uh, weeks and months when Apple and Microsoft really rotate lower, these are the two largest uh, names in the, uh, in the S&P. 
they have the ability literally to drag the whole index down. And note how Apple and Microsoft, both about 7% of the S&P, you gap down quite a bit to Amazon, NVIDIA, the multiple shares of uh, Alphabet uh, and Tesla, which are down in sort of the 2 to 3% each range. So Apple and Microsoft are really the most significant ones. And this is an issue that we've talked about with the uh, major benchmarks uh, for sure, with the S&P and the NASDAQ 100. But also things like the XLK, because Apple and Microsoft make up about 50% of that ETF. With the consumer discretionary, Amazon, Tesla, probably about 40%. You know, I would say with Home Depot, it's probably about 50% of the ETF in uh, communication services. You have Alphabet and Meta, which dominate all the rest of the sector. So those stocks not only dominate the indexes, they also dominate three of the most commonly used sector spider ETFs, the XLC, the XLY, and the XLK. So these names are important to understand. Working a lot with institutional uh, money managers, we'd always talk about you know needing to have a good read on those big core weights in your benchmark because if you're wrong on one of them, that's a huge performance hole to try to dig out of. So let's talk a little bit about just the overall condition. So the FANG plus index is the index that we're looking at here. It's dollar sign NY FANG on stock charts. And this is an index uh, created by the New York Stock Exchange as a way of tracking those um you know, those FANG stocks. And it's not just the FANG stocks like Meta and Alphabet and uh, Netflix and and, uh, and, um, and others. It's also related names. So things like Tesla are included in there, like Twitter was at, you know, at different points. I, I don't know exactly the comp- composition, but I remember uh, at one point looking in some of the Chinese internet names uh, were, uh, were involved as well. So it is sort of a, and that's why it's called FANG Plus. It's like the FANG stocks and other FANGy type of names that are out there. So it really is a benchmark based on mega cap uh, tech communication consumer, very similar to the QQQ, to be honest. And if you look at the trends in both, they're very, very uh, closely related. So what strikes me about the chart of the FANG Plus index is how it was in a clear uptrend into the peak in mid-July, right? Higher highs, higher lows above an upward sloping 50-day moving average. Checks all the Dave Keller uptrend boxes very quickly. But then look at how all of that changed. We're now threatening the 50-day moving average. We've spent a lot of time here in the last couple months below the 50-day, more time below than above it, to be honest, since August. Uh, But you also know how the 50-day moving average has now flattened and is now sloping downwards. We have a pattern of lower highs and lower lows. So overall, you can see that the uh, the FANG plus index really no longer going up at best. At worst, probably in a bit of a downtrend. Now, there is a pretty consistent support level. It's around 7,200 on this index. Breaking below 7,200, if that would occur here on another uh, drop, maybe going into uh, late October into November, I think that could be a really negative sign for Uh, for stocks. Now, if you look at the relative performance of the FANG plus index versus the S&P 500, pretty much in line, right? It's kind of a market performer. And again, that is less that these stocks are doing particularly well or poorly. I think it's more of the fact that the S&P really is dominated by these names. And so, you know, it's unusual. It would be unusual given where we're at for there to be a big discrepancy between the FANG stocks and the rest of the S&P 500 in the fact that they've all sort of lightened up. Back here, when the FANG stocks are ripping to the upside, you could see the relative outperformance. But really, since mid-June, it's been stable, meaning the FANG stocks and the benchmarks as a whole are kind of together, right? That They are the market. Now, which particular names are we talking about? When I think of the Magnificent Seven and Friends is what I call them, and sorry if that's a horrible name, that, that's what I'm going with. I think of it in sort of four general buckets. The first are the big, the mega cap technology stocks, Apple and Microsoft. These are the first two. Now, if you just look at the trends, and we'll go in a little more detail through each of these to talk about our own ranking. We'll do them in rank order. But just to start, we have Apple and Microsoft, uh, the two mega cap technology names. Both of these, of course, making a new 52-week high into July, making lower highs and lower lows from that point on. And that's a theme we'll come back to. The second bucket are the mega cap communication services stocks, Alphabet and Meta. And just initially look at the two mega cap tech stocks and the two mega cap uh, communication services stocks, you can see why the XLC overall has been in a bit of a better position because the mega cap tech names in a clear downtrend making new lows, you can see both Meta and Alphabet are either making a new 52-week high uh, in October or very close to doing so in the case of Meta. 
The third bucket are the mega cap consumer discretionary names, Amazon and Tesla. Now, these charts, I would argue, are sort of question marks, right? Amazon making a bit of a head and shoulders top-ish pattern below the 50-day moving average. Tesla in a well-documented coil pattern or symmetrical triangle pattern, unknown or unclear as to what the direction may be after that. Then you have kind of the other two, right? You have NVIDIA and Netflix. I like to include NVIDIA because I think the semiconductor space is so important to follow because it's really the backbone of the modern economy. So a stock like NVIDIA doing well, I think, tells you a lot about the market conditions. NVIDIA, I would argue, forming a potential head and shoulders topping pattern, which is concerning. And Netflix, arguably the least attractive of all in a clear downtrend and breaking down below a downward sloping 50 day moving average. With that as a setup, let's look through each of these um, uh, eight stocks one by one and talk about how we come up with a particular ranking system. So these are those stocks, as I mentioned, and, and we went through the, the eight uh, names that, I'm, uh, that we're going to kind of deal with. You can see the uh, sectors that are, uh, that are attributed here. So again, we've got two in community, sorry, three in communication services, including uh, Netflix. You have two in consumer discretionary, Tesla and Amazon, three technology, Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. And you can't underplay the value or the importance of analyzing these eight charts and getting a sense of where they're at, because I would argue that's that's the market. That's the benchmark. Think of the returns that we've seen in the first half of 2023. These names are really the reason why uh, those uh, those numbers are so good. Without these names, those numbers are probably a lot less uh, a lot less attractive. So how can we start to put these in a meaningful order? I immediately am drawn to the stock charts technical ranking or the scooter ranking. What's really cool on the uh, chat on the uh, chartless summary page. So this is what you do is bring up, put these in a chart list. I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, click on the summary uh, tab or the summary report and make sure you have uh, some of these columns. I like to put sector, industry and scooter ranking. If you don't see those on your own login, click on the little columns button and make sure you have some of these uh, checked off. I like market cap as well, just so you get a sense of the relative size and, uh, and, and, and scale of these different uh, businesses. Then you can sort on the column heading. So just click on scooter and you will sort in descending order from strongest to weakness. Now, the scooter ranking, again, is looking at the entire large cap space and it has a series of technical indicators that are combined to create a quantitative rating, a proprietary quantitative rating uh, that we call the scooter ranking. Now, we share with you the details of it. So if you click on the little magnifying glass, type SCTR, go to our chart school uh, article on the scooter rankings. We share with you the formulas, talk about the different time frames that are considered. And it's more skewed to long term versus short term. So long term, I think, is about 60 percent of the weight. I think medium term around 30 percent and maybe 10 percent on short term. I might, I might be making those up a little bit, but it's about that's about right. Uh, it's somewhere very close to those numbers that I just shared in the article. We'll give you the specifics. So when we sort by the scooter rankings, what do we find? Meta, NVIDIA, Alphabet at the top of the list, followed by Tesla. Then you have a bit of a gap down. Those are all in the top decile, right? The 90 percentile plus. Then we gap a little bit down to Amazon and Microsoft, both around 75 to 82 percent percentile. Then we have a big gap down to Apple and then a major gap down to Netflix. And as we mentioned, just, you know, looking subjectively at the charts, pretty clear that a Netflix, not particularly good and something like a meta testing new all time highs in a much better position. But the scooter rankings, really good opportunity to take a list of anything of stocks, ETFs, industries, uh, whatever it is and put them in, a, in an order at least to start with. I wouldn't, uh, you know, I, I think stray from the scooter rankings that much, except I would put Alphabet at the top of the list. I would go Alphabet, Meta, NVIDIA, Tesla, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Netflix. That's kind of the order of technical attractiveness by my subjective read. And now I'm going to go through each of those eight charts one by one. I'd love for you to look at the evidence that I'm sharing. Think about your own charts. Analyze your own charts of these eight names. Then again, leave a comment below and let me know which order you would put them in from best to worst based on whatever techniques that you want to do. And share with me how you're doing it. Now, that would be helpful as well. So I'll start with my top name, which would be Alphabet. What I like about the chart of Alphabet, and if you followed my work on uh, the final bar on my own YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior, you've seen me talk about Alphabet probably in a number of different ways. I think it's a really good example of a stock in an uptrend. And so often when I'm giving presentations, I need something in an uptrend and I need something in a downtrend. Just as an example, just to show people Here's what a good chart looks like. Here's what a bad chart looks like. And the bad charts, I think for a while now, it's been something in consumer staples or a beaten down media name in, uh, in communication services. So like a 
ADM and Archer Daniels Midland or like a Kellogg or Hershey's or something with, you know, just a clear rotation to a distribution phase or something like a Warner Brothers Media or Discovery or Disney, these like big long term downtrends. But the uptrends have been a little little harder to come by because a lot of stocks that had looked very good in the first half of the year starting to rotate lower. And I think that's what makes a chart like Alphabet so strong here and so compelling. As a matter of fact, I think one of the top 10 charts for October 2023, we put that out a couple of weeks ago and and go on our YouTube channel here, go back a couple of weeks, you'll you'll find that uh, episode. Did a special episode just sharing 10 charts that I thought would be important to follow in October. Alphabet was one of them. Uh, And here's why. It's just a classic uptrend, right? Well, a lot of stocks have now made lower highs and lower lows. Looking at you, Microsoft and Apple, Alphabet, very different, right? It's an outlier in the fact that it's just kind of gone up. When the market overall struggles, and by looking at a stock, you can't see that market disruption on the particular chart, that tells you something special is happening, in my opinion. So that's why stocks breaking above uh, resistance like an MUSA, a Murphy USA, or something like Alphabet, just pounding away with higher highs and higher lows in the face of broader market weakness. I think that's really compelling. Now let's go down through a brief sort of technical checklist and talk about why exactly a chart like Alphabet is a strong chart, in my opinion. Number one, it's the Charles Dow, basic Dow theory, higher highs and higher lows, as I've said many times on the uh, on the show. So we have an uptrend of higher highs and higher lows. We were above an upward sloping 50 day, which is above an upward sloping 200 day moving average. Overall, I think this is pretty, pretty strong. And I think a key moment for Alphabet was here in September, right? We pulled back in August. We made a new high. We pulled back again. Instead of making a new low, we actually held this level of support right around 127 uh, a share and now broke higher and once again threatening a new uh, a new high for the year. The momentum overall has remained strong on pullbacks. The RSI has not gotten below 40 really since back here in the fourth quarter of last year. So overall, the momentum is strong. And of course, with that sort of pattern in a down market, the relative strength is going to be exceptionally strong. And that's why Alphabet for me is number one. Number two for me, I would stay within communication services and stick with Meta. Now, I think Meta in some ways is a little bit unproven only because we have a major league resistance level. It's right here around uh, $330 a share. That was the high from July. That's the high again uh, just here in the in the last week. So I think Meta getting above 330 really validates a bullish thesis on this stock. Uh, the 50-day moving average has flatlined a bit because of this sort of consolidation phase that we just came out of uh, a couple weeks ago. But overall, the stock is still good. Any Anything in this sort of environment threatening a new all-time high or a new uh, you know new 52-week high, pretty strong in my, uh, in my opinion. What's interesting, uh, and, and, and another point, is just the relative strength. So incredibly strong with, uh, with Meta. And look, look how underperforming, how consistently of an underperformer it was in 2022, and then how quickly that reverted to a dramatic outperformer. And that's why relative strength is so helpful, recognizing that shift from underperforming to outperforming. So vital, I think, for equity and uh, ETF investors. Look at the momentum characteristics, all in the bearish range here on the left side of the chart with the rally phases, right? When we rally in this downtrend, the RSI rarely gets anything above 60. Look how consistent that is. Things change here in the fourth quarter, and then all of a sudden we're rallying. We're becoming overbought as we rally. On the pullbacks, the RSI is remaining above 40. And so the whole range of the RSI has moved higher. Meta is a classic example of a distribution phase and an accumulation phase and how that has evolved right, for this particular stock. So overall, I would say the chart of Meta um, still pretty strong. I think holding above the 50-day moving average, really holding a bit above this August low, which is around, we'll call it 280, I think is pretty uh, is pretty important. On pullbacks on a name like this, I'm just watching to see if the RSI holds 40, which is why here it was like, all right, things aren't too horrible because at least we're holding that 40 level. And when you start breaking that level, that's when it tells you we're maybe shifting to more of a broader decline with more intense selling uh, in those uh, in those uh, pullback phases. So that's chart number two, Meta. NVIDIA, NVIDIA, excuse me, is uh, number three. The concern I have with NVIDIA, and going back to the chart of, uh, of um, Meta, by the way, one of the key tells, I think, with Meta and others is look at the bearish momentum divergence. June, July, August, higher highs in price, lower peaks in momentum. That told you that the uptrend was probably near its end point. When you look at NVIDIA, you can see a very similar pattern, which I've highlighted in red. 
the concern I have with NVIDIA is it might be just early on in this distribution phase, right? You have this higher highs, June, July, August, lower peaks in momentum. This last new high when NVIDIA touched $500 a share, the RSI didn't even get above 70. This is after earlier rallies had pushed the indicator to that overbought region. So higher peaks on weaker momentum are usually not a great sign. So that's a concern. We've now made, I would argue, a clear lower high, right? So we made a high in late uh, August around 500. Now we're making a lower high. We didn't even get above 480 on this last rally higher. Now we're starting to turn lower a little bit. Now the key with a chart like Nvidia is what's called the neckline. So this could be a very obvious head and shoulders topping pattern. And that's where you have um, you know, the head, the left shoulder, the right shoulder. And if you make it like a one year chart, uh, probably a little more uh, obvious. Let me uh, let me do that here. The one year chart probably makes this. Uh, yeah, it's just it's, it's such a rally in the uh, in the first half of 2023. It's it's compressing this whole range here. Uh, but trust me when I tell you it's a pretty good, a pretty good example of a head and shoulders top. Here we go. So here we have the uh, head, the left shoulder, the right shoulder, which I would argue is now starting to form up pretty well. What this means is if and when you break below the neckline, and now that we've zoomed in a little bit, I can make this neckline a little better. Here we go. I'll take that low, and that's not too bad, right? Connecting that uh, low and that low, there's your neckline. It's right around $415 a share. That's not too far below where we're at currently as we're recording this video. So we break below $415. We break below that neckline. That suggests further deterioration. Now, based on the height of that pattern, that would probably only measure down to around the 200-day moving average, which is around 340. That's another 100, 100 points uh, below uh, current levels. That's, that hurts. That's a 20% drop. Now, that's not an, an insignificant drop, uh, but it's certainly a, uh, a, 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 a confirmation of a distribution phase. So NVIDIA is still good in that it hasn't broken down yet. Not my favorite chart. The reason why it's not more highly ranked in this uh, particular list is because it's forming a potential distribution pattern. I would argue Meta uh, Alphabet still quite strong. Uh, no real danger of distribution yet that I'm seeing, whereas uh, NVIDIA really starting to show this potential head and shoulders top. And remember, with a head and shoulders top, it's only a valid breakdown or a valid sell signal if and when you break the neckline. And so 415, I think a key level to watch for NVIDIA. Our fourth name is Tesla, and this is where we start getting into some of the, I don't know, more uh, questionable trends, if, uh, if that's a way to, uh, to put it. The chart of Tesla is one of the best examples I can come, with, come up with right now of what's called a symmetrical triangle or a coil pattern. And that is a traditional chart pattern really popularized by Edwards and McGee, John Murphy, Martin Pring, Charlie Kirkpatrick, and Julie Dahlquist. I just mentioned all the people that wrote sort of the classic texts on technical analysis. The ones if I was teaching a course in technical analysis, I'd probably use some combination of those books that I just uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, and the reason is because they are really a good survey of technical analysis. And Edwards and McGee, which is really the Bible of technical analysis, and I would argue of chart patterns in particular, talks about the symmetrical triangle pattern. This is where you have lower highs and higher lows, a consolidation phase. If you think about what the market is telling you, in uh, May into June, Tesla got up to around, we'll call it $250 a share. Then we overshot, undershot, overshot, undershot. And you can see we're basically just rotating around this equilibrium price, which is right at the middle of the pattern, right around $250 a share. So what the market has been telling you is since June, since mid-June, Tesla is worth about $250. And all we've done is overshoot and undershoot and just rotate around that equilibrium price. So what's interesting is at some point, something has to change, right? The triangle will reach what's called an apex and usually about two thirds to three quarters of the way through, which is right about where we're at now in mid-October the pattern breaks, meaning we break out of the pattern to the upside or break out to the downside. Whichever way we break, that usually tells you the direction of momentum is further in the direction of the breakout. So I can't tell you based on the pattern right now which way Tesla is going to break. I think each one equally likely based on the patterns that I've seen, it is a very well-formed coil pattern. This is literally, as Jesse Livermore or others might say, it's a time to go fishing or a time to sit on your hands, a time to wait and see which way it breaks. The direction of breakout is the direction of momentum, and that's what I would be uh, inclined to follow. So I, it's a neutral at best right now based on that consolidation pattern, and that's why Tesla is sort of middle of the pack for me. 
Now we're getting into some of the charts that are showing signs of concern, showing me signs of distribution. May not have completely broken down, but they're pretty close to doing it. Amazon and um, uh, what's the next one? Um, uh, Microsoft and Apple are all charts that are sort of in a bit of a distribution phase here. Amazon is probably the best of the three because it just recently broke down through its 50-day moving average. It's attempting to get back above it, but I'm concerned that now we're below a downward sloping 50-day. Just like the S&P 500, the reason why I think that's a concern, you're getting an equal uh, concerning tone, I think, uh, hopefully uh, watching this one. Look at how the most recent drop the RSI went uh, uh, notably below 40. So this is starting to be more in the bearish range than the bullish range. So, you know, the fact that we've broken down through support, the fact that we're testing uh, support, which is now resistance from a, a below, is concerning. It gets back above the 50-day. Really, it gets back above 145. Then, then I think it's back to a positive trend. But for now, I find it is facing a resistance level, a key resistance level. And for now, I can't give a thumbs up because it's not above that point. As with anything, I think, uh, you know, uh, making a confirmed lower high and then rotating lower, the stock gets below 125. I think it really validates more of an Apple and Microsoft kind of trend, more of a downtrend. But for now, Amazon, I think questionable at best. This brings us to Microsoft and Apple. And again, the concern I have on these charts is they look a lot like the S&P and I share the same concern I have for the broader market. We're making lower highs and lower lows. And while the longer term trend is not broken yet, neither Microsoft or Apple are below their 200 day moving average. Uh, in this case, uh, the 200 day for Microsoft right at a big round number around $300. So we're well above that. So the long term trend is still not broken. But the short term trend is certainly more negative than positive. Look how these rallies in September and now October, the RSI is stalling out around 60. So this is compared to in March, April, May, June, you're making new highs in July and the RSI is becoming overbought. The pullbacks, the RSI remains above 40. That all changed here where now the rallies are stalling out at an RSI around 60. And again, the most recent sell off, the RSI went below 40. So the range is kind of coming down. I see this as a pattern of lower highs and lower lows. This stock above 340 looks a lot better than it does now. But for now, I'm seeing a negative pattern, a bearish pattern. The chart of Apple kind of in a similar configuration. Again, we're above the 200 day moving average, currently around 169, we'll call it. That is also in line with the September low. So for me, the real line in the sand for Apple is that 169 to 170 range. If it breaks below that on the next, uh, the next drop, I think that's a real concern because that means we're breaking below the 200 day, which is not a, a good thing. And it just completes this pattern, continues this pattern of uh, lower highs and lower lows, which has been uh, in place really since the peak in, uh, in late July. On Apple, and again, you'll note with a lot of these uh, more distributive charts that I've shown you, note the bearish divergence, higher highs in July, lower peaks in momentum. Um, this is a chart that's more in the distribution phase. This brings uh, me to what I would argue is the least attractive uh, Netflix. And it's not uh, a coincidence that out of the eight stocks that I've just uh, that we've gone through, this is the only one currently below its 200 day moving average. So for me, easy one an easy one. Right. In, in terms of when you think about the strongest to weakness, how do you put them in a meaningful order? Anything below its 200 day moving average immediately goes toward the bottom of the list. And then I try to figure out which one's the least attractive out of that bunch. Only one satisfies that requirement right now, and it's Netflix. And that's why it's an easy vote for me at the bottom of the list. Similar to Apple and Microsoft, it's made lower highs and lower lows. What's most concerning is the thing we talked about, which would be such a negative development for Apple and Microsoft, breaking that crucial 200 day moving average. Netflix has already done it. The momentum is in a clear bearish range. It's now clearly underperforming uh, the, uh, the, the benchmark and the rest of the market. So out of the eight, I think a clear vote for uh, Netflix at the bottom of the list. So that is the order that I would use to, uh, to sort of put these uh, eight stocks into order. And as a reminder, I would start with Alphabet at the top and then go Meta. So it's the two mega cap communication services names, then NVIDIA. Tesla and Amazon are really more, you know, middle of the road. They're more neutral than anything, but concerning. And, and certainly you have a clear uh, pattern with, I think, a clear trigger. And what I mean is a level at which you would assume that that's getting uh, a lot worse than you might uh, might expect. And then we get to some of the more uh, negative charts, the mega cap technology names, Apple and Microsoft, and then finishing off with Netflix, which I would say being below its 200 day moving average, clearly the weakest of the bunch. How would you put 
those eight stocks into rank order from strongest to weakness? Drop a comment below. Give me your order. I'd be very interested to see if you agree or disagree with the order that I've put here. As a reminder, if you want to learn more about our scooter rankings, the Stock Charts technical ranking on StockCharts.com, it is a free part of our website called Chart School. You can click there at the top and then search for an article or just click the magnifying glass type SCTR. Look for the Chart School articles on uh, the Stock Charts technical ranking. We'll give you all the formulas. Maybe that's something you could incorporate into your own process to better make sense, especially of a large group of stocks or ETFs. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Thanks so much for joining me for this special edition of The Final Bar. We'll be back live on Thursday, October 19th, with our latest uh, live episode. And I'll be coming to you from the FinCon Conference in New Orleans. Until then, be well, stay safe, and have a good night.